So thank you everyone very much for joining us here today for this Knowledge Rights 21 webinar on scientific innovation and growth. What should the EU do in its 2024 to 2029 mandate to support research? Um, we're really happy to be organising this event so soon after the European elections. And it's really, we hope, an opportunity to look ahead, to think about all the opportunity that there is, how we can really do better, how we can build on a lot of the work that's already taken place in order to strengthen the EU's research base and to do so in a really in a new way, in a different way, in a really effective way. I think the underlying question within all this is that what does a comprehensive agenda for realising Europe's research potential in 2024, 2029 look like? And this is a question that should really matter across the political spectrum. Clearly, it's a question of competitiveness. Our research, Europe's research, is a strength, but we often talk about a type of innovation paradox where this strength on the basic side doesn't necessarily transfer into new businesses, into new jobs, into new opportunities that help us keep up with, keep ahead of our competitors globally. But this is clearly also a question of equity and of uh, the delivery of broader social goals. The grand challenges that we face can only be addressed through innovation, through research. They can only be, this is the only way we're going to be able to find solutions to these. And clearly, of course, if not able to allow all of Europe, all of Europe's member states, all institutions, all individuals to enjoy their right to research, their right to science, we are underperforming, we're under delivering. Crucially within here is the word crucial within here is the word comprehensive. Um, one thing that we call for is knowledge rights 21, and I'll say a little bit more about the campaign shortly, is this idea that we need to use all of the political levers available to us. We can use funding and the Euro European Union is clearly a world leader in funding and drawing on its funding capacity and the rules it can set down around this to make change happen. But what else can happen? How can we draw on, how can we make sure that regulation in other areas really makes a difference? How can we make sure that the laws that the European Union puts in place are really advantageous, support, send the right signals to researchers, enable Europe, as said, to address global challenges, keep up with its competitors? In terms of our agenda for today, we're very happy to start with a keynote speech from Michael Arentoft, um, the head of, uh, head, of, head of Unit for Open Science at the European Commission. We're also very much looking forward, we'll then have two panels, one looking at a better deal for the information economy from 2024 to 2029, and that's going to be a view from think tanks and from the think tanks and from Knowledge Rights 21. We're also then going to be looking at how the information and technology regulatory environment can best support scientific advancements and growth, taking very much the institutional perspective. And finally, we'll be closing by, by launching the Knowledge Rights 21 uh, EU Action Plan, Knowledge for a Stronger Europe. And we're very looking, much looking forward to this, which we hope is a basis for moving forward on defining just such a comprehensive agenda. The speakers we have today are here, and um, I will be talking a little bit about each of them and introducing the, each of them as they come along. Um, and so you, you will see more of them, but in short, we're very happy to welcome Michael Arentoft, Gerard Osterweig, Maria Alessina, Benjamin White, Marcian Gaillard, Lydia Borel Damian, and Ole Peter Ottersen to, to speak with us today. So we've got a really excellent panel, people who know a huge amount about how research works and how we can hopefully make policy, make the legislative agenda for research work better. Very quickly about Knowledge Rights 21, um, which I'm uh, representing here today. Um, so Knowledge Rights 21 is an initiative that aims to shape legislation that feels that's born out of the sense that too often the experiences of researchers, of educators, of scientists, of, le of lecturers, and of the libraries, librarians and libraries that support them are not always heard in policy making. And in that, the reason and the consequence of that is that too often we have an incomplete, a fragmented approach that means that while some in some policy actions we may support access to research, education and culture, in others we hold ourselves back. We want to sustainably mobilize these experience, create networks on the ground, make sure that this voice can always be heard, that these experiences are brought together, that they are expressed clearly. And finally, we want to try and deliver practical and policy change in different areas. Specific ones include ebooks, contract override, open norm, secondary publishing rights and rights retention. But I think really crucially in this, it's how do we create this really positive, this, the, how do we create this really positive um, uh, research agenda going forward? So um, 
I'd like now very much to um, welcome, I'm going to welcome Michael Arantoff uh, to the, Michael Arantoff to start us off by giving us a, a bit of a keynote speech from his perspective as the head of unit. Um, to summarise, so Michael Arantoff um, was previously, before becoming head of unit, was Deputy Head International Research and Innovation Cooperation Strategy, Innovation Union Policy Officer, Acting Head of Strategy for ICT Research and Innovation, Sector Head for ICT Research and Innovation Work Programme and Planning, Coordinator of ICT Essential Technologies and Infrastructures, and a Project Officer in High Performance Computing and Networking. So I think you can see there's a huge depth of experience of how to support innovation, how to support new ideas to come forward. Before joining the European Commission, he was with Computer Resources International and with Rob Singh International. His educational background is from the University of Pennsylvania's Computer and Information Science PhD program and from the Technical University of Denmark's Electrical Engineering Master's program. So with that, I'm very happy to hand over to Michael to, to kick us off. Thank you, Michael. Many thanks, uh, Stephen. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, thank you to... Um, Knowledge Rights 21 for organizing this uh, webinar. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I would also like to thank you for your um, uh, recent papers, your recommendations for the next commission, which um, will uh, take office at the towards the end of this year. Um, and also your suggestions for uh, how to make the fifth freedom uh, part of the single market and how to make this uh, a reality, which um, uh, you also referred to in the uh, introduction to, to this webinar. Um, so, of course, uh, talking about that, the, the contribution from uh, Mr. Letta uh, back two months ago is, is, of course, very useful for the Commission. There will be another uh, very useful report coming from Mr. Draghi in, 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 in a short while, and uh, we very much see uh, this report from Mr. 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 Letter as uh, useful because we in the Commission, of course, for a long time have been uh, a key promoter of open science. Open science in the in the sense that this is how you should do research. This is, should be the modus operandi of of how to do research and, and innovation. Um, why have we been promoter for so long? Uh, well, because we believe uh, open science is important for so many reasons. Um, uh, to mention the keywords, quality, efficiency, creativity, trust in, in science. So we, we see that open science uh, increases the quality of research, it increases the efficiency of the research. When we share all the research results and when, when we make them reusable, uh, if we improve the reproducibility uh, of the research results, then at the end of the day, of course, we increased the robustness, we increase the quality and we we increase the, the productivity of the whole research system. Uh, I also mentioned creativity. And, and here also, we, we really see uh, results that are more creative uh, because open science is also about collective, collecting intelligence. It's about cross-disciplinary uh, research. And I mentioned trust. Uh, we have seen that it increases trust in science also, uh, not only because of what I mentioned before, uh, it increases the robustness of results, but also because it engages researchers alongside end users and citizens. So uh, that's why it has been uh, on the top of our agenda. And I would say in particular, uh, in, in the last four or five years, when we revived the European research area, you see it's at the top of the era policy agenda. And of course, also, as you know, uh, we made a, a step uh, increase in how open science features in our uh, framework program. So it was present throughout Horizon 2020, uh, some of the features only in pilot form, but now it's uh, on the Horizon Europe. It's really a comprehensive approach that we have to open science, both in terms of obligations, the provisions in, in the contract, but also uh, very much in terms of pushing in, in terms of encouraging open science uh, where it makes sense in, in the different projects that we fund. Um, what I want to say also, because you put in the title, uh, what should the EU do in the next uh, mandate? Uh, whereas now, of course, there's very much a focus on what the EC, the commission should do because we have a new commission coming in. But I think you're right uh, to emphasize that this is an EU agenda and open science indeed is not 
just a priority for the Commission. It's very much also a priority for our member states. Uh, of course, there are very close links between the two. And um, uh, five, six years ago, in 2018, we updated the 2012 recommendation that we gave to the member states for uh, to, to encourage the member states to design and to implement also open science policies and open science action plans. And um, at the end of last year, we came out with a report where um, we had surveyed the different member states uh, and analyzed what is the uptake of open science policies and practices in the member states. And it, it really shows that over the last five, six years, it has uh, taken off. So uh, what we see now, or what we saw at the end of last year is that um, 70%, a bit more actually, of the member states have by now a national policy for open access to scientific publications. And if you compare that to the last time we surveyed them, which is four years ago, we were at 45%. So we've gone in the space of just four years from 45 to 70% in terms of uh, countries having a policy for open access to, to publications. We also looked at research data management. And here we see uh, it, it's, it's not the same figures, but still we're now at 45% of the member states that have a policy on research data management. And this is a tripling, three times as much as in 2020. Uh, so uh, we, we see really open science taking off uh, both in terms of policies, in terms of action plans, and in terms of implementing these. Uh, could be in various forms, uh, either in as provisions in programs for to get grants nationally, or uh, uh, different implementation measures at the institutional level. Um, so I mentioned the Commission, I mentioned the Member States, I would like to mention also the global uh, dimension. And here we also see that open science is becoming uh, more and more recognized as changing the game. It's a game changer for science uh, uh, worldwide. So of course, a very important um, uh, milestone here was at the end of uh, 21, where uh, UNESCO set a, a global framework for open science policy for practicing open science. So this is the UNESCO recommendation on open science from November 21. And uh, we were part of this process and we were very happy to see also at the end of the day because this was a negotiation with 193 countries, so it's UNESCO, um, that this uh, framework, this UNESCO recommendation is very well aligned with uh, the commission's policies, with the, the policies for open science that we have uh, in Europe. Uh, I would like to mention also uh, the, the Coalition S initiative. So, you know, Coalition S is the uh, international consortium of research funders and research uh, performing organizations. And that also has been essential in supporting uh, the transition towards full and immediate open access to, to research publications. Let me let me go back to uh, the report from Mr. Mr. Letter. Uh, what is quite remarkable there is that he argues for this need to shift um, from an economy which is based on ownership to one which is more based on access and sharing. And uh, as I mentioned before, to achieve this shift, he, he envisaged to introduce a, a, a fifth freedom, fifth freedom in terms of enhancing research, innovation and education and putting this fifth, fifth freedom at the core of the single market, which of course is uh, the key pillar for, for the EU as a whole. Uh, and of course, from our side, we, we believe that uh, such a fifth freedom should have open science at the very core of this freedom. And also we should use it from the European side, from the EU side to act really as the global leader to champion uh, international standards for how we share knowledge and for uh, how we set up the principles of open science and how we practice, how we apply these principles, how we practice open science. Uh, so for this to happen, we need a range of things that are very closely interconnected. We need, first of all, to motivate our researchers to do this. So we need appropriate uh, rewards, incentives. We need uh, appropriate 
infrastructures, open science infrastructures that uh, make it easy to practice open science. And we also need the legislative and regulatory environments that facilitate uh, the uh, access to research results and the reuse of research results. So, so we need a range of enablers for, for this to, uh, to happen. Uh, I mentioned that uh, open science is very much part of the revived era uh, where uh, we have uh, the ambition to create a space for our researchers, a space for the knowledge, a space for the technology that can circulate freely uh, across, across the era. And of course, we are working to tackle uh, many of, of the challenges. So uh, as you probably know, under the current uh, era policy agenda that um, was kicked off in 22 until the end of the year, uh, we have an action on how to make EU copyright and data legislation and, and the regulatory framework for that, what we call fit for research. Now, what does that mean? It means that uh, we're looking into how this framework can best enable uh, and encourage this circulation, free circulation of scientific knowledge across the EU, um, that, uh, how it can best allow researchers to also cooperate uh, freely across uh, the, the, the borders. And of course, whenever we encounter barriers, we would like to, of course, to remove any uh, obstacles, legal or non-legal obstacles uh, that uh, block or slow down this circulation or this uh, cooperation. So, of course, at the core of that, we need to have an adequate copyright and legislation and adequate data legislation, because that's the uh, regulatory framework that uh, sets up the conditions and uh, that, that, could have, that will have an impact or that has an impact on how we protect scientific results and how we disseminate uh, scientific results. Um, so we, um, as part of this uh, action under the current era policy agenda, we have uh, uh, looked into how to gather uh, evidence of what are these uh, barriers, uh, these uh, obstacles, and, and what would be the options to do something about it. So what we see from this increasing uh, body of uh, uh, evidence is that the current pro provisions that are relevant for research under the uh, EU legislation presents uh, several challenges, both uh, individually, so for individual researchers, but also for the organizations of the researchers. So as you are probably aware, we uh, have had a, a number of expert studies um, uh, last year and the year before as well. And in uh, May this year, we published the results of a major study that we have undertaken since summer last year. Uh, let me mention some of the most common barriers that uh, this study showed uh, that were encountered by our researchers. So for instance, uh, lack of subscriptions by the organizations, which was a barrier to, to the day-to-day -day research. Uh, inability. Uh, to get the permissions from the copyright owners is, is another one. Fear of copyright infringement is a third one. So there were a number of very practical examples uh, that were gathered fr from this uh, study and that added to the, the body of, um, of evidence. Now, of course, copyright exceptions and limitations do exist for the purpose of uh, scientific research. Uh, but what we also know is that these exceptions are mostly um, non-mandatory and some of them are quite narrow in, in scope. And uh, what we saw from uh, the number of surveys conducted by the study that is that this creates uh, fragmentation. It creates from the side of researchers and research organizations um, uh, legal uncertainty uh, regarding what they can do or what they cannot do uh, with their work or with the works of others. Uh, what we saw also from the organizations uh, is that uh, they also report challenging that emerged from copyright law, not only in uh, what the researchers also did in, in terms of access and reuse of publicly funded research results, but also challenges in terms of making the results available in, in open access. 
So uh, a, a useful study uh, or series of studies, and uh, I, I must say that now we have a clearer picture of these uh, on existing challenges, these existing barriers, uh, which means that uh, we uh, have a much better basis now to look for possible solutions to attack these uh, challenges. And that's why the study also uh, not only did surveys uh, to, to get evidence uh, in general, but also with very practical examples, but it also presented uh, what could be options for measures, be they legislative or non-legislative. Uh, let me mention some of them. I mean, you can, uh, of course, um, look at the details of the study uh, in the publication. Uh, let me mention first the possible introduction of an EU-wide secondary publication right legislation uh, and the provisions that could be included in such an uh, SPR, secondary publication right uh, legislation, which would span from uh, the, the, the range of scientific outputs that could be included the embargo period to be allowed and, and, and other parameters of an, of an SPR. So the study goes through all of these sub options as well for a, a possible EU wide secondary publication right. Um, another set of possible measures is around how to strengthen uh, open ended uh, flex and flexible research exceptions. So, of course, this could be achieved by introducing a, a fully harmonized mandatory and general exemption for scientific research. It could be uh, achieved by clarifying lawful forms of access. It could be achieved by removing excessive barriers posed, for instance, by um, technological protection measures. Um, a third one I could mention uh, would be uh, around commercial, non-commercial. So, abandoning or making less stringent the requirements of non-commercial purpose in the copyright uh, a key. Uh, and maybe one last one I would like to mention is the option uh, uh, to um, give guidance on current TDM, uh, text and data mining provisions that are contained in the copyright directive. And of course, this with the view of raising awareness on one hand, but also to facilitate implementation by the research community of, of this uh, part of the copyright directive. Um, finally, I should mention that um, uh, it was uh, uh, to a large extent uh, a lot about the EU copyright legislation, but the study also analyzed uh, provision that are, provisions that are relevant for researchers and research organizations in the EU data and digital. Uh, legislation and and what what is the interplay between the different legislative instruments under the EU data and digital legislation. So what they highlighted the study team in their report was um, was a landscape that is not always easy for researchers and and research organizations to navigate. So they put forward a number of recommendations to improve this uh, situation. Uh, so all of these findings around the copyright and around the di data and digital legislation uh, really were complementary, dig deeper into the evidence that we had collected through um, uh, a number of independent expert studies, four actually, that we published in, in 22, and also complementary to two large workshops that we had with stakeholders, with legal experts, and with the member states uh, that we held back in 22 and, and 23. Now, uh, based on this evidence that uh, we have collect collected so far, uh, we are now planning to identify possible measures, uh, be they non-legislative or legislative, that uh, could be undertaken by, by the next commission. So, of course, in this uh, process, we need to take into account for each of these possible measures uh, the benefits for the stakeholders, the impacts on the stakeholders, and then, of course, uh, identify those that uh, would most effectively contribute to what is our ultimate goal to enable open science, to realize the European research area, and also to respond to this vision from Mr. Letta of the fifth freedom to enhance uh, research and innovation, education in the single market. 
So uh, as I said, um, among these meshes, we uh, could think of introducing an EU-wide secondary publication legislation, question mark. Is, is that something we could consider to introduce? We know that over the past decade, six member states have already introduced a secondary publication right in their national laws. Um, uh, Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, France, Germany, Nether the Netherlands. Um, and we know that also other countries are looking into this opportunity. So what we see, is there a need to act now? Could we introduce something which is more harmonized? Otherwise, we, there could be a risk of fragmentation. So the question for us is, could we introduce a new wide secondary publication rights uh, legislation? Second question, besides the SPR, uh, how could we enhance the current copyright provisions? So again, based on the evidence collected, uh, maybe two questions. How can we best remove any barriers for transnational consortia that need to share knowledge resources without being blocked in their research or without being slowed down in their research? Again, question mark. Um, uh, we know that unequal access among partners to publications or to data or to, or to any other research output limit the remit of the research that, uh, that can be carried out or can lead to delays, as I said before. And, and of course, this is not good for science. Uh, another question we're asking ourselves is how can we best uh, make sure that researchers can access uh, very large amount, very vast amounts and very high quality data, which is essential for training AI models. Of course, this is a, a key question these days where AI use in science is, uh, is, is very promising for increasing uh, productivity, for increasing again the quality of the results. So uh, here in particular, recent developments around AI and particular, of course, generative AI bring uh, new un legal, legal uncertainties as to how um, uh, current copyright rules should be should be interpreted. So again, around copyright provisions, two questions that we ask ourselves: How can we remove best remove any barriers for transitional transnational consortia, and how can we best help researchers using AI in their daily work? Maybe before I end, I have talked a lot about the EU as a policymaker. Uh, both in non-legislative and legislative term, terms, but I would like to mention also that we are a funder, of course, as you all know. And of course, in, in this role, we're also supporting this endeavor of free circulation. Uh, let me mention, for instance, we, we are uh, about to launch a project, project that will uh, assist in building capacity on uh, IP management. IP management, which is very important also to enable uh, open science. So this project will start in the autumn. It's a result of the recent call and uh, the project will support uh, research performing organizations, will support researchers with the training material, uh, a platform for sharing best practice, awareness raising campaigns. And of course, the important uh, goal of the project is to increase the understanding among the research community of the IP assets that they hold and the role that the etiquette management of these uh, IP assets uh, is, uh, is playing to enable uh, open science. So uh, what's next? Uh, so uh, hopefully we will soon have a commission president elect. We thought we had one last week, but uh, at the end uh, there was no agreement yet. Uh, so hopefully we will have one soon. We will, of course, have a new college of commissioners and uh, together they will propose uh, the, the priorities for, for the, their term. We are, of course, on our side, providing all the input needed uh, in discussion with, with you as the stakeholders, with the member states, um, uh, and also um, uh, in close collaboration with other services uh, within, within the commission. Uh, in particular, as I said, uh, this is an action under the ERA policy agenda. So we're also discussing this very much in the context of the ERA forum, which is bringing together member states, uh, the associated countries, and the, very importantly, the stakeholders, uh, which is, uh, uh, we've seen is very welcome to have this co-creation 
not only between commission and member states, but also very much with the stakeholders at the table, uh, assisting uh, the commission implementing the uh, European research area. Uh, and of course, this discussion and this guidance also for the ERA forum will be very central to, to identify also the, the final set of measures that we will be proposing for the next uh, commission. Um, then I would like to say also that uh, whatever we put forward for the next commission in, in, in their agenda for the next five years, uh, these identified measures, of course, will still be subject to further evaluations, further assessments, and this would include also an economic impact assessment. And they will be uh, subject also to public consultations as any impact assessment we do uh, in the commission. So I'm towards the end. I hope I've not been too long. Uh, I would like to thank again Knowledge Race 21 for being so active in contributing to uh, strengthen the evidence that, that, that is always needed, um, not only in terms of evidence, not only in terms of the challenges, but very much also in terms of possible uh, solutions. So we count of all of you on all of you to um, uh, support us. Uh, in the proposals that we will be putting forward. We would, uh, of course, we as uh, concrete in terms of the measures that uh, could be uh, implemented. But as you can see, quite a lot of evidence, more evidence still to be collected, uh, options to be discussed with stakeholders, uh, with the member states uh, before we put them forward. We are asking ourselves a number of questions, a number of options are on the table. So uh, that's what uh, we have in front of you to select between these. Those would have would have a best uh, impact on uh, reinforcing the European research area. Uh, and I'll let, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That, that, that that's fantastic. I was just thinking and summarising that compared. I don't know where we are today compared to where we were five years ago, and <clears throat> thinking that in in that time we've had open science as a fundamental principle of research, as a basis for research affirmed as a policy principle. I think that's always important because once when things aren't affirmed as a policy principle, they often get forgotten or neglected. Now it's up there, we can really think and we can really reflect on how is this working? How do decisions in other spaces affect this? Um, what's holding us back? What's, what's preventing us from realising the full potential? So that making sure that open science is a policy principle is huge and um, all of the work that, that that your team has led on in terms of doing that work on, the, on 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 building up the evidence base and understanding what the research community wants what they need what the experiences they actually have but setting out some of those options has been incredibly useful so i don't know that this isn't a conversation i think we could have so easily had five years ago and and I think thanks to the work that you've done, we're extremely well set up to having a really positive, constructive, purposive discussion about what what that research agenda, what that research policy, research legislation agenda looks like in the coming in the coming years. So thank you so much to to, to you and your team for showing such leadership on that. That that, that that's been a huge help. Um so I, I'm I'm conscious we're at we're, um five past ten already. What I might suggest is that if there are questions for um uh questions for michael i might put those in the chat so that we can get on to the um next panel if that's okay um i'm just going to share the screen again so um i suppose um the first panel that, that that we're looking at is a better deal for the information economy and this is the one where we're going out to the think tanks and the organizations that are are there to look across the policy agenda to think about what could be changed what's holding us back what could make sense as part of that broader political agenda and and i think and the idea of a, a a new deal a better deal is nothing new i, I know certainly under the previous commission and parliament calling things deals was a, a, a obviously quite a hot thing but um effectively what does it look like how can we provide a more coherent a more robust a more supportive policy framework to mean that we can actually really develop an effective, a high-performing and inclusive information economy into the next four, into the next five years. And so with this, I, I have the pleasure of introducing three speakers. Um, I'll introduce each of them in turn. And then I said, you should talk for up to 10 minutes each, and then that should leave us about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. So 
First of all, I would like to um, invite Gerard Oosterweik, Gerard Rinse Oosterweik, to speak, and he's the policy analyst on digital for the Foundation of European Progressive Studies. Before joining FEPS, Gerard served as a political secretary and director of the Four Out movement in the Brussels Parliament and as a senior policy advisor in the European Parliament. His experience in the private sector includes roles as an operational manager and marketeer at ING Bank and as co-founder of a political startup. Recently, he's been active in setting up digital initiatives to promote a public space on the internet. And Gerard comes with a master's in European social policy from the London School of Economics and an LLM in private law from Leida University. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Gerard. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, and uh, it was very interesting to... Uh to listen to uh, Michael uh, introduce uh, what the commission is working on. And uh, and I must say it's quite complex uh, uh, when it comes to, especially when you come into the to the AI uh, part of it and the, the copyright and, and all of that. Um, so I will talk a little bit about what we are working on um, at FEPS, because uh, as you know, it's a very, uh, very timely discussion to be had uh, with the with the new European Commission. Uh, the Commission elect is not uh, yet, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, it's not yet decided, but soon we will have a new a new mandate, a new term. Uh, the new European Parliament is elected, so this is a moment to put in uh, new ideas. Um, and we've been working already for the last year uh, on, on what is the next strategic step. Um, as Stephen said in the introduction, I'm the, the digital policy analyst. So I look at this mostly from a digital policy perspective. Um, but I think research and innovation is, is an essential part of that. And uh, and why am I saying this is also because here at FEP, so we are the think tank of the, the social democratic family. So we are being paid by the European Parliament to do research. Uh, and uh, not only doing research ourselves, but working with researchers uh, in um, in different universities and uh, and also with civil society to to actually work on a more long term vision on uh, on policy. Um, and I'm saying this as well because we have uh, here in in house we have also a colleague that's doing more the economic and the competitive side of of Europe. We have somebody working on the the climate and the green. Um, because for us, I think this uh, this new year, the new uh, uh, European Commission, there's there is a lot of talk now about industrial policy, and I think that's where uh, the letter report is very interesting to see this this fifth freedom. But we are also looking into this. Uh, yeah, we need we need uh, uh, quite some some investments and and different policy than we had before to make sure that Europe stays competitive um, and uh, investments, for example, in public digital infrastructure. And I think also what I've read also from Knowledge Rights Twenty One, you are also proposing this uh, this this digital infrastructure for the research uh, the the research and innovation is an important part. Um, we have seen that the last term was really about legislation uh, tech um, and I'm interested to read as well like I, I noted down also Michael uh, the, the studies I haven't read them yet but I will read them uh, we have a lot of legislation in the digital domain uh, coming in coming into force uh, only now or just just before uh, the digital service act digital market act the AI act and and all of this is uh, is going to set a new a new boundary and also creating new opportunities perhaps uh, new for for alternatives but um, the last term was really about regulating and setting boundaries to the to the private actors because when you look at the digital uh, the digital sphere and the digital economy, uh, Europe has been in the lead when it comes to legislation, but not in the lead into creating the infrastructure that's needed to to function. Um, and and with AI, a new wave of, of innovation once again. I think when it comes to the actual research and the universities and the knowledge, we do have it. But when it comes to the infrastructure to run these processes, it's very hard to keep up with the with the also the 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 spending power of the big big tech uh, corporations. So I think there is a there's a real challenge, um, and it's something that you cannot do like even on the member state level. It will be hard. Or especially on an on a university level, it will be hard to to duplicate the, the the power that's needed. And I'm talking about the supercomputer capacity, with the cloud capacity, the data sets, everything. It's it's such on on it works on such a scale that we need to scale things up. And that's where um, um, also uh, we we would like to see also the European Commission, but also the new the new like uh, the collective. So it's also the member states. It's not only Europe. 
but to see how 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 do we actually uh, realize uh, this? And I think also when it comes to to this, um, so I'm looking at it a little bit from a more practical perspective. There's a lot of research, and uh, and I agree, like when it comes to copyright and and the open science. This is, is creating new um, new opportunities to share, but can be also very practical. Like, where is this knowledge? Like, on which platforms? Uh, it was mentioned as well, the, the licenses, the su subscriptions. Also, for me, working at the think tank here, like, we are not the university. We don't have all the subscriptions. There's a lot of research I cannot... I cannot uh, get to um, unless I ask for permission, and that takes then time. And and so we have, we have really an issue there. And I I, I see a, a potential the digital transformation. It's, it's giving a lot of opportunities to share knowledge uh, uh, and and to work together and to collaborate across border. And and there's a lot of opportunities, especially if you uh, throw in AI in the mix, huh? uh, the 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 processing of all the data on a on a higher speed. But this means that we need to, from a European perspective, and at least that's our perspective at FEBS, it, it, it also needs a public domain, a public uh, side of things um, where the infrastructure is not only in private hands, or even if it's in private hands, that it is like accessible also uh, uh, from 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 for uh, for the the common good, and um, yeah, and I think this is uh, this is something where we we will have to see because. We've seen with the COVID, uh, we had the, uh, um, the Resilience and Recovering Fund. There was a huge, huge, huge investment also from the European Union into uh, the member states. 20% had to be invested in digital uh, and even more in, in green. This was like mission-based mission, mission -based funding. Um, but if we see now, and this evaluation will still follow, I think, because it's it's only it's ongoing, I think, even. But uh, we, we will have to see how much did actually impact how much was actually created that that gave a new uh, new impetus for when it comes to the to the digital uh at the 20 percent that was spent for digital it was spent in a very uh opaque way yeah, for us it's very hard to see like it was the member states giving a plan an action plan and 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 of course uh we will have to see how much impact uh did this this recovery fund have um, but i think on the european scale the new multi-annual financial framework the new the horizon program of course but like we need to think about this very strategically um as europe as an innovation leader research leader and i wouldn't rule out uh also investing in some actual infrastructure when it comes to cloud computing when it comes to supercomputing capacity but maybe also other very basic things as like uh, a place where you can uh, find all the open science in one place one one database which is ac accessible and also easily to be uh, to be to be searched in and that we don't have to go through through private um, private and fragmented uh, platforms, so I think that's where uh, where we are are, are pushing for, um, and I think this is also like it has quite a a broad basis. We've seen indeed like something like the letter report it really helps uh, with those with those things. So I don't think that it should be very. Um, what we've also seen as well with the with the with the, the the digital legislation that we had, like there was a lot of it was politicized. There was a lot of lobbying from the big tech companies, uh, especially because of course it's not in their interest to be to be regulated. But on the other hand, I think within the European, like yeah, in the European uh, cross party, it was very cross party uh, effort. And I hope that we could do the same now for innovation research, but also for digital public infrastructure, because in the end, it's in the interest for. For, for Europe and for the, the 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 competitiveness for the innovation also for society um because now here we're talking really about about more research but when it comes to education as well like there's a lot of worries I think uh when it comes to parents and how digital infrastructure and how learning experience is being is being managed by private actors the Google schools for example so we are looking at that and I think also in the letter report it was also the healthcare sector was really like put to the forefront so those are already two sectors where we see we can get really concrete and come maybe with concrete projects um but i think and uh, that's also where where it becomes tricky also running all of this from the level of brussels and from the european commission with with funds it is tricky we really need to get also maybe the methodology right to to do these investments and to have some 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 actual results some some synergies and 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 spend the money wisely in coordination with the member state and with stakeholders like the universities, but maybe also at the education uh, stakeholders on the, on the lower level. So I, I think I will stop there. But I think um, this uh, the, the, there is a fertile ground to do this. Um, and it's very interesting to read also the proposal of uh, Knowledge Rights 21 uh, in this field, because I think... Uh, 
yeah, we should we should have a broad basis for this. And and if I can say one thing, so to to follow to to close, like I think this is the thing that uh, that makes Europe um, have an edge. We have a strong public university sector, strong research sector, strong research innovation sector, um, and uh, and now it's time to support that because there will not be a lot of time, for example, in the AI field. To catch up, there is already like I think uh, that because the the scale of things are so big, um, it will be it might be I wouldn't say too late, but we cannot we cannot wait another five years and see what happens. Uh, I'm afraid. So there's a time. Uh, there's some urgency. Thank you. Thank you very much, and and, and <clears throat> I think that the, all the points you make are extremely well taken. I think that key point about the importance of ensuring there's actually access. And 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 that in in the decisions that are being taken around research, we really are thinking about how does everyone actually get involved. There's been a really interesting um, <clears throat> there's been a really interesting point made in the in, in the Q and A, focusing on the risks of I don't know, for example, on building access to super supercomputing resources and how I don't know, clearly this is something where sharing makes sense that allows people to get access in a way that isn't that get access in a way that that wouldn't be possible otherwise but we need to make sure that the rules are in place the laws are in place to do that i think also an approach to trying to depoliticize the approach to some of these things that we shouldn't i don't know we need to legislate at an appropriate speed i think there's a risk of rushing in doing so that things end up being politicized things end up being over lobbied and um, uh, things end up being over lobbied, but then you know, we need to legislate in a way that actually supports research, really, supports that access. So, um, with that, I am then going to. I'm very happy now to hand over to um, to uh, there we go to Maria Alessina um, from the Federation or uh, from the um, the European Liberal Forum. Um, Maria is a policy and research officer there and alongside the Foundation of European Progressive Studies. It's one of you uh, and, and it's one of Brussels' foremost think tanks. Um, Maria holds a PhD in interdisciplinary European periodical studies and she specializes in European cultural, social and neighborhood related affairs and has professional experience in journalism and editorship. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Maria and just remind everyone that if you do have questions, please do ask them in the Q&A and then we'll take questions to everyone at the end of this segment. So Maria, over to you. Uh, good morning, Stephen. Uh, yes, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, first of all, really very happy to be here on behalf of the European Liberal Forum, also alongside other colleagues from other think tanks and uh, the Commission, of course. Um, I will be rather brief. I will, um, I will rather um, outline the priorities uh, which are currently on the table for the Liberals, because uh, indeed, it's uh, I work for political affiliation to think tank, work for the European Liberal Party, uh, Renew Europe for the European Parliament, and indeed it's a very timely uh, discussion and I'm myself curious uh, not only to speak but uh, also to take notes uh, of what's uh, what's being currently uh, brainstormed within the community because uh, of course now we're heading to the new mandate and uh, it's a challenging one, it's a new one, it's uh, the one which is happening amidst all the global shifts uh, and transformations and this is something which is uh, very much being talked about within the liberal family at least on the EU level but also on the national levels. How do we deal with uh, all the challenges and all the as well as opportunities which come up with the geopolitical um, competition which come with the security challenges which, which come with the of course digital transformation and uh, uh, in the same way as um, FEPS and I, I believe other think tanks uh, in Brussels who have been preparing throughout the last year to the upcoming mandate and uh, thinking about what needs to be put on the agenda for the upcoming members of the European Parliament and of course uh, the Commission and the expert group around it um, and uh, this is very much a common understanding that education and research is one of the key long-term investments which uh, must be prioritized. It's uh, We all know that this sector sometimes uh, unfortunately come uh, last and uh, but it looks like at this point, looking ahead to the next 20 to 30 years, Europe cannot really afford to um, to think short term. It needs to think long term and to, it needs to understand uh, what are the key uh, leverages and what are the key uh, assets that you have and invest in them. And education is certainly one of them. And I agree with what was 
uh, was has been said before that a strong um, university and um, research um, base that Europe has uh, is one of the sources of our innovativeness and uh, and as a result competitiveness and I myself I did a PhD uh, at Ghent University within a collaborative project funded by the European Research Council and I know the benefit of uh, of this kind of trans, uh, trans uh, cross disciplinary uh, cross boundaries project which which uh, which bring together different kind of expertise which uh, also invest partially also uh, developed a database uh, and of course it was uh, it is being kept uh, open and uh, all this all the things are personally very dear to my heart and that's why I'm uh, trying to put it also on the agenda for the liberals and uh, we have published a uh, issue uh, dedicated to European culture and creative industries uh, looking ahead to the next mandate and uh, this is it by the way I have it with me it's a it's a journal uh, and uh, I'm the editor of it and I was very very happy to have uh, Knowledge Rise 21 as one of the contributors because indeed um, most of the topics which we as liberals cover they come very much uh, uh, they cover mostly uh, digital economy. So, of course, it's uh, the transformations uh, which are brought by digitalization to the to our cinema, to our music streaming, to uh, to other uh, like sports and uh, uh, video games industry, for example. But uh, the topic of research and um, libraries and uh, education per se is somehow still being kept as a separate one and not always directly seen as related to competitiveness and um, innovativeness of the European Union. And uh, so I would like to focus uh, not on the specific uh, proposals which we have, because this is something in the making. And again, I myself am very curious to, to hear what others are doing and very happy to collaborate on this, uh, on the think tanks level, but then of course, hopefully later on the political level. Uh, so I will not focus on the concrete proposals, what needs to be done, and I think the keynote speech was uh, very, very insightful in that regard. I would rather outline the priorities overall with the Renew Group uh, will be pushing for and what relates to the uh, education and research and what actually came out of this study, which we just published a month ago on culture and creative industries. Uh, one of the things, uh, and how it also overlaps with the knowledge rights uh, report, um, knowledge rights in one report, uh, I was actually curious to see uh, some sort of interesting overlaps in terms of methodol uh, not methodology, um, concepts. Uh, you speak a lot about fifth freedom, and was, we, we had one of the contributions talking about a fourth pillar of liberalism, which is epistemic liberalism, which means the, the need to uh, keep knowledge uh, freely circulating because this is the the key source from the enlightenment and from 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 long long uh, years before the european union even and of course in the last decades uh, of uh, this is the key source of europe's creativity and the key uh, key source of europe's uh open-mindedness and um uh, we need to cherish this. We cannot take it for granted. We cannot just rely on something which has been done before. This fear needs to be cherished and it needs to be, of course, put in place on the legislative level in line with the current uh, digital uh, transformations which change completely the whole uh, landscape and uh, the old instruments don't work. And if they are not properly adjusted and adapted, uh, we can put it bluntly, forget about our uh, of Europe, uh, Europe's cultural intellectual prominence in the world. We need to be to think in digital terms and how to make it uh, function for the next, uh, I would say, decades, at least a few decades. Another overlap is uh, the overlap between open science and open society. Of course, open society for the liberal uh, thinking is a huge concept. is basically the basis of uh, how we see uh, our social, cultural life, political life. And uh, open science is, a, in a way, uh, application of this concept in a more concrete terms. And, uh, of course, I also agree with how... Uh, how we need to adjust our public sphere, how the, the the function of the cultural debates, of the creative industries, of the media sphere, of the uh, uh, European transnational public sphere becomes digital. And also we need to set up the infrastructure, digital infrastructure for all that. But open science is an indispensable pillar, uh, is, a, uh, is again the source of it. 
um, myself coming from academia, that's how I see it, and uh, uh, ensuring the, um, that this sector has all the tools and all the means that are necessary for uh, making the knowledge circulate. The and circulation of knowledge means also bringing different ideas together and shaping something new. This is the the whole uh, point of creative laboratory which uh, European universities uh, have been for the last couple of decades. And uh, so, yeah, the, the the task, the very specific task now waiting, putting it very in very practical terms, now looking again at the new setup of the European Parliament, seeing new members of the Parliament coming in. Um, now it's a very good moment to uh, outline specific uh, proposals which will be very much uh, in the spotlight for the next five years in the uh, cult committee of the European Parliament and uh, um, we, we had a few very good uh, members of the Parliament from the previous uh, mandate we have a few very promising ones coming for this one and yeah this next couple of months will be exactly the moment to to put all this into very concrete terms and said that we cannot do everything, uh, but uh, the question is what to prioritize. And I think that um, circulation of knowledge and research is definitely one of the key, key, key uh, priorities on the abstract level. And then it comes down to the uh, digital tools to make it happen. So yeah, this is uh, this is it for me. I'm very happy to yeah to hear different perspectives. <laughs> Thank you very much, and, th and thank you obviously for, for bringing directly that that practical experience of I don't know how and why it matters to be able to do cross border research, and and and, and already I know we had M Michael mentioned how much more creative it's possible to be when you're working with other people, and and especially working for people working with people in other places, and and so obviously I don't know cross border research is something that that you know, financially the EU supports very strongly, and and Marie you mentioned the European Research Council. How can we make sure that all of the different policy levers support that is going to be a key question. I, I, I also really appreciated how you um, bringing up firstly the connections between different policy agendas. I think I don't know two, two, two things jumped out at me. Firstly, <clears throat> the potential that there is to to make the link between call to open societies and the idea of openness in general and making sure that a push on open science support for open science is linked to that that it's not seen as an issue on its own this should be a much broader cause but i think a, a really interesting point you made is the degree to which education and research are not seen as being linked to europe's long long-term competitiveness i think something that, that we've noticed overall and, and i think we find is almost quite concerning is that Often innovation is seen as a purely private sector thing and research is seen as a purely public sector thing. And, and that has no basis in reality whatsoever. But there's often this sort of disconnect, this failure to actually mobilize these pretty essential long term drivers of Europe's ability to be competitive and to solve global challenges. So <clears throat> thank you very much. That was that that that, that did, the, did the job really well. So um, I'm going to. Now, hand over to uh, the last speaker on this panel, and that is Ben White. Um, ben is a co-founder of Knowledge Rights 21 and a researcher at the Centre for Intellectual Property Policy and Management at the University of Bournemouth, focusing on IP, artificial intelligence and trade law. He's got a background in publishing, having worked for Pearson Publishing Group in the UK, uh, Hong Kong and Japan. He was formerly head of intellectual property at the British Library and has spoken as an expert witness on legal matters in both the UK and the European Parliament and has been an invited speaker a number of times at the World Intellectual Property Organisation. So over to you, Ben. Thank you. Can you can you hear me OK? Yes, you're very clear. You should just go can full I... screen on your slides and then we're good. Yeah. Um, let me just so good morning, everybody. Um, I will talk to the EU action plan. Um, so starting big picture, uh, as as all the other speakers have made clear in an in an advanced economy, research intensive uh, industry of, and of course, basic research is vital lifeblood of uh, economic growth. And therefore, it's quite right that in Europe, we invest something like 150 billion euros each year of taxpayers' money in research, of which about 10% of that is Horizon Europe. And yet, if you look at the documentation, um, that particularly that comes from Europe, um, a lot of 
a lot of people talk about the innovation paradox. So the inability to turn basic research and research into economic growth. And this is really what the Enrico Letta re report much more than a market sort of goes to. And, and he, he says that fragmentation across the different member states and the lack of freedom of information is a barrier to, to growth. And of course, if we're talking about freedom of knowledge, freedom of information, um, you know, ideas are free, but he's not really talking about that. He's talking about knowledge which is crystallized in in data, in in text, in sound, in film. And therefore, that inevitably is a discussion about how we regulate information and data, which is uh, copyright law and our relate and related rights, um, and and this is important because copyright is an extremely important cultural policy, but with of course the advent of information technologies, it governs all forms of copying, and therefore it governs how we undertake research how we undertake science, it governs entire information technology markets. So it's grown out of all proportion to, to what it was originally intended to do. Um, and, and, and therefore, and copyright, I, copyright is, is not the issue per se. Copyright, as I said earlier on, is a very important cultural policy. But the issue that we have in Europe is that it is poorly calibrated and it is poorly calibrated and that has a negative impact on knowledge valorization, the ability to do basic research. And therefore what KR21 is calling for is a recalibrated copyright regime, which really puts education, research and knowledge, knowledge valorization at, at the center. Um, you know, we, we 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 did a blog recently about the innovation paradox where we talked about you know our, our the european economy is driving with a handbrake on because of poorly poor, poorly calibrated eu and european copyright law i guess another analogy is 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 the log jam that we 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 spend billions tens of billions a year in research but it can't be appropriately uh processed exploited because we have copyright laws which which um don't support re research so i'll give just one example before i move on to the eu action plan so based on figures from the bbc if it would take one european startup or sme five months to clear um permissions to do data analytics on a hundred websites um, if those websites reserved the rights. So, for example, they said that it was only for non-commercial use. So a small SME or let's a public-private partnership between a university and a commercial company would spend five minutes, five minutes, five months trying to clear rights in, in 100 websites. Um, whereas if, if they were based in the United States or Singapore or Japan or South Korea, they wouldn't have to clear any permission to do data analysis of competitor websites. So that that's kind of a, a concrete example of 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 the problems that we face in in Europe. So to, turning now to the EU action plan, um, first of all, uh, <clears throat> referring to the Enrico Letta report, we believe that there should be recalibrated. Uh, better freedom of knowledge, freedom of information, freedom of data across member states. And of course, let's not forget that Horizon Europe is there to promote cross-border research. And yet we have, as the report makes very, very clear, legal silos across the EU 27. We believe that there should be a standalone research and education act Um there are many, many issues that, that go across data laws, IP laws, digital laws. Um, and we think, and very, very often, they forget research and knowledge valorization. So we think that there should be a, using EUA's terminology, university check or a research check or a science check. Um, and I think many of the problems that we see could sit under one act. 
We think very importantly that there should be not this prescriptive shopping list of flexibilities in EU copyright law, where essentially all, all, all the switches are off unless legislation switches them on. We should learn from countries like Japan and Singapore, America, Israel, South Korea, et cetera, and introduce more flexible approaches to copyright law, which are more, more principled. And, and essentially in those states, much of the innovation levers that involve information are on unless they're switched off by, by, uh, by, by legislation. So, so we think we should learn and actually empirical evidence suggests that introducing flexible approaches to copyright law has a positive effect for technology industries and research and has and and there is no um and, and actually empirical evidence suggests that there's a benefit for the traditional copyright industries also so we think also that open norms have the the ability to deal with the fragmentation that we see across eu copyright law so member state silos so for example if you're doing machine learning in it as part of a collaboration, a non-commercial collaboration in Germany, Sweden, and Spain. Um, in Spain, you can do machine learning on software, but you can't in Sweden and, and, and Germany. Germany allows the sharing of training data, but Swedish law and, and Spanish law doesn't. Who's who's who? Which country's technical uh, security measures apply? Is it those of Sweden or Germany or Spain, according to the law? So we have all this sort of legal fragmentation still, and we think that an open norm not only empirical evidence suggests supports economic growth, it will it will help iron out the fragmentation that we get from the transposition of directives. We think that we should learn from Japan um, and introduce sort of higher over, oversight of the importance of intellectual property law to put science and research at the heart of how we think. And that includes a sort of a stronger um, DGRTD. Um, and we think that there should be a, a, a university check again when introducing legislation. So science and research is always thought about. And as Gerard mentioned, sorry, four is actually about digital public infrastructures and the importance of investing in, 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 in those infrastructures. But there's no point in investing in those digital infrastructures if the information laws don't allow the content to flow across the, the those structures. Introduce, we believe that we should introduce a secondary publishing right in law, as well as author rights retention provisions to support the public investment in science. Uh, digital licenses create absolute information monopolies. This is a problem that we see a lot in the university se sector. It's come to light, particularly in the case of ebooks, where publishers are refusing to license content to universities. And therefore, we think that there should be a much stronger kind of look at um, IP from a competition law perspective. Refusal to license bundling, secrecy, all raise competition law issues. And yet, IP creates monopolies. So we think that there needs to be a much sort of stronger um, competition focus. Um, and, and because we are seeing universities not being able to acquire digital content, a university can buy any paper book, any paper journal, any analog film, DVD, but it is, but they are being excluded from access. Um, and, and, and therefore we think that there should be a right of access for education and research purposes. My final slide, sorry, I'm about to run over very slightly. Um, we think that the artificial barriers between commercial and non-commercial research which do not exist anywhere else in the glo in, in, in the world need to be removed they prevent knowledge valorization. So universities uh, who work on machine learning um, 
find it very, very difficult to work with private actors because of this artificial division between commercial research and non-commercial research. Um, flexibilities in law should be protected from contractual and technological override. What's the point of introducing laws if private actors can then remove them via contract and, and the use of techni technical measures? And finally, um, recognizing the imbalance of power between universities who must acquire information and those that sell it, um, and the very risk averse nature of universities in terms of not wanting to um, incur liabilities. We think that we should learn from unfair, con un unfair contract law and basically protect universities and educational establishments in the same way that we protect um, uh, citizens from unfair um, imbalances of power between licensor and licensee, and that individuals acting in good faith should have limitations on liabilities in terms of IP uh, law, as we, again, as we see in other jurisdictions outside of Europe. Um, but I think Stephen will talk, I will stop sharing. Um, Stephen will talk a little bit more about the EU action plan later. Thank you very much. Oh, looks like Stephen's... Dealing with, dealing with the um, potentially you know, absurd situation that an issue that is as important as research and innovation, an issue that is so critical for the EU's competitiveness and its ability to face the future with confidence is treated merely as an exception. Um, and how do we actually address that? But also this broader thing that we're looking at copyright, but we also need to look at contracts, how they're applied. We need to look at liabilities. We need to look at the level of political priority, the coordination um, the effort to avoid inconsistent regulation coming through. And I think that's really what the EU Action Plan looks to do. So um, if people do have questions, um, please do put them in the chat. We do have a couple of questions that are already up there right now. Um, so the first, um, I, 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 I aimed at Michael, but then please all, all other speakers look to build on, on these answers. So the first one was, um, Michael, you mentioned um, the stakeholders um, who need to be borne in mind when assessing the impacts of measures. So who do you see as those stakeholders as being? Yeah, uh, I think, I mean, obviously it's um, the individual researchers, uh, the research teams, their organizations, but uh, I would like to add also research infrastructures and research services. Um, I think um, a second set of stakeholders are around, and this was also uh, emphasized um, as part of the interventions in this panel, the, uh, the infrastructure, uh, both in terms of operators and in terms of uh, technology in these infrastructures. Uh, of course, the rights holders, uh, very important as well, the, the, those holding the rights of the knowledge of the data and so on, uh, scientific publishers, be they commercial uh, or non-for-profit, uh, and maybe last, of course, uh, people like us, research funders, research policymakers. Uh, I think this is um, it, it's a broad set of stakeholders, and I th we absolutely need to see it from from all sides. These are the the, the four, if you like, subsets of stakeholders. Thank you, and and, and uh, I think we certainly only agree from from this side. And as mentioned at the beginning, one of the reasons for knowledge rights twenty one coming to be was to make sure that some of these voices are actually heard that I don't know but I think we know that often within the library field there's a I don't know there's not always the automatic connection between when something isn't working do you actually go and identify that as a policy issue and do you get involved in these consultations so it's extremely welcome to hear that um I I, I maybe I'll go to the second question unless um Maria Ben uh Gerard, do you have answers on on that question about about stakeholders and, and how you see processes going forwards. I'll dive to the second question then. Um, so um, this is from uh, Greg Lindahl, who notes that his European collaborators report that they have access 
to European supercomputing resources in a different EU country. And we talked a little bit about this in response to Gerard's point, but the other country has a different interpretation of text and data mining clauses, which of course may will, will create issues around what it's possible to do with legal certainty. Um, I don't know, Michael, if you could give a sense and, and Greg's asked, will this be resolved? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I raised this also in my um, introductory remarks. Uh, the fact that access is unequal, the fact that you have different interpretation of the rules, it, it really puts breaks or at least it limits the, the, the scope of the research that can be carried out or uh, yeah, it causes delays or even blocks it. So it, indeed, uh, Greg, this is among the messages that we're considering. Uh, we, we, we are indeed looking into solving the problems like the, the one you mentioned so that um, access to the resources would be the same in, in all countries. So the question we're asking is if, if a partner in country A can benefit from a research exception in the national law, should then all partners in the consortium be able to benefit? So I, I think this is, uh, uh, your example is great and uh, it's exactly um, one of the issues that I mentioned uh, that that we're looking into. Again, and, and indeed, I guess there's a, a strong issue here of the effectiveness of Horizon Europe funding, which of course is a lot of the times entirely its focus on the possibility to work across borders and to collaborate. So hopefully progress in this really leads to greater value for money there. I can see Ben's hand up. Yes, I just wanted to state that, you know, that's one specific example, but these issues of cross-border collaborations and different copyright laws go across all sorts of activities, not just machine learning. And, and that's why we think it's so important that an open, flexible norm is introduced as, as outlined, because, um, you know, if, if the member state laws differ, if they all have an open norm, then they all have the ability to fill those gaps and say, well, actually, it doesn't um, it doesn't undermine the legitimate interests of the copyright holders. Actually, although the law doesn't explicitly say it under the open, flexible norm, yes, we can we can then un undertake that activity. So not only do, do flexible approaches support growth from looking at empirical evidence, I think in Europe specifically, it, it will help with with the fragmentation, the legal fragmentation that we have, because it will act to to, to fill in those gaps. Great, thank you. Was that a good example of how to actually work towards a longer term solution on that? Um, let's give just a couple of seconds more for any questions to come in. Otherwise, I suggest that we then actually move on to the next round of presentations, so we have a little bit of time at the end. Okay, with, with that said, so therefore, um, <clears throat> I've already thanked Michael at the beginning. Thank you in particular to Gerard, to Maria, to Ben for your interventions there. Please obviously stay with us. Hopefully there'll be further questions coming up. Um, so now <clears throat> I'm going to move to our second panel. Um, and this looks, this takes very much the institutional perspective. So the, the, the perspective of the, the key organizations, the key associations representing the interests of scientists, of academies, of universities, of, you know, of other research centers, across Europe and um, the organizations that end up having to implement the rules that are in place and therefore most likely seeing where there are potential challenges where really experiencing firsthand the challenges that there are. So I'm very happy first of all to uh, invite Vincien Gaillard to take the floor. Um, Vincien is Deputy Director for Research and Innovation at the European University Association. She's responsible for the EUA's comprehensive approach to the transition to open science, so very on topic for today. As such, Vincien oversees the association's work to help its members transition to open science, contribute to the development of those national policies that Michael was talking about, as well as European and institutional policies that are conducive to the mainstreaming of open science, and also to encourage universities to play a proactive role in the regulatory and financial frameworks shaping this process. Before joining the EUA in 2019, Vincien worked as a scientist and then as research manager in the field of cognitive psychology and neurosciences for more than 15 years. She holds a doctorate in psychology from the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium. So with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Vincien. Thank you very much for having me uh, today. Uh, and good morning all. 
It's my pleasure um, to contribute to this um, to this panel today uh, because it's a very important uh, topic for us at EUA. Very quickly, uh, I'll just first um, introduce what EUA is so that you, the audience, get what is it that we do. So we represent uh, more than uh, now 890 uh, universities uh, in Europe. Uh, and that is uh, in the broader um, higher education area, so it's over 51 countries. So we are really the voice of universities in uh, Europe. Um, with this, uh, we represent uh, universities with their uh, unique combination of missions in learning and teaching, research, innovation and culture. So it has been said uh, by um, colleagues uh, before me, universities really make a, a pivotal contribution to ensuring the resilience and the prosperity of our societies. So it's really important that um, universities are considered as key partners in uh, getting to um, greater levels of economic and social well-being as well as civic engagement. So. This is what we are, this is what we, we do, and our members uh, do on a daily basis. Now, um, I wanted to focus on, let's say, two parts. Uh, the first one is more of a general introduction on, let's say, the open science and open access uh, elements, uh, just to make it clear that EUA advocates for universal and perpetual open access to scholarly outputs. Outputs in a general is a general terms uh, uh, that we use in a just uh, publishing ecosystem. We also envision envision a scholarly ecosystem when fair uh, research data, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable research data, is the norm in producing and sharing uh, scientific uh, knowledge. And therefore, as a general principle, any measure that advances the uptake of open science by universities, by our members, by harmonizing practices and facilitating, facilitating research activities and scholarly communication of academic actors is therefore uh, super important and very much uh, welcome. So that's, let's say, uh, the broader spectrum on open science and open access. Now I'll turn to um, the uh, regulation or the regulatory aspects uh, overall. Um, mentioning uh, this need uh, for universities as institutions um, to um, work around clear and predictable rules and regulations. So this is of utmost, of utmost importance for universities to get um, regulatory frameworks that fit uh, their purpose, um, that ensures their institutional autonomy and their academic freedom. We, nowadays, these are elements that are even more important than ever, I would say. So this is, this is important for us. I'll give you um, two examples where um, universities as institutions experience difficulties in that because the regulatory frameworks are not so fit for purpose. One is something that was mentioned earlier is on the knowledge valorization and let's say the translation or from from the the work done uh, the research work done at universities to, towards like um, implementation on the on the ground. Um, more and more we hear about current discussions on more interdisciplinary and more intersectoral research careers, the fact that it's important to be um, to go outside, to go back to university or to come from out the outside world, let's say from non-academic um, uh, settings coming to universities to contribute to this um, uh, cross-pollinization in a way. But the regulatory frameworks uh, do not help in doing that. There are many obstacles uh, in, in the ground on uh, getting that. There are universities that because they are public sector, cannot have, for instance, um, for their um, staff members, cannot have a private uh, um, uh, activity. So they cannot have, or it's not easy for them to have like as a side or in addition to their research, the academic research career to contribute to um, a, in a SME or in a startup, for instance. So this is a, a very good example where the knowledge valorization, this, let's say, natural um, feed from 
fundamental knowledge um, creation to knowledge valorization, it is um, hindered. It is not, uh, at least it is not made um, easy. Uh, the other one that I wanted to mention, and this is very much also to uh, close to the topic of today, it's the blank spot in EU data and digital legislation, which is um, on education and research. That's been said already. So um, I just wanted to um, say it again that th this has been um, difficult for universities as institutions to deal uh, with that. And this is why, in, and, and Ben mentioned that already, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, this is why EUA calls for the introduction uh, of a university check prior to developing EU legislation. So to assess the impact of legislation on universities and their activities, and here the focus is on the digital transformation that we can think of trade migration, the rule of law, strategic autonomy. I mentioned it could be about um, also like um, pensions, uh, if you think about the careers. This check should actively involve universities and ensure that new legislation will not hinder education and research and innovation uh, activities. So this is why the sector, the research and higher education sector, um, repeatedly calls for more thorough consideration of the effects of proposed European legislation on this vital sector. We partnered with, with um, uh, colleagues from across the world of research and higher education uh, to ask for um, uh, different um, steps in this. So it's about reviewing the European Union's innovation principle, updating the Commission's better regulation toolkit, ensure um, that the impacts on education, research, and legislation are duly considered and improved through inter-service collaboration. This was mentioned by um, Michael. Uh, actively reach out to our group, let's say our sector, uh, as part of the impact assessment process, and uh, act now uh, to remedy the negative impacts of recent digital legislation on the sector. And I will I will just close uh, on this um, because often we, we've been told, yeah, but as part of the impact assessment, we run consultations um, and, um, and we get feedback from uh, that many researchers, uh, etc. And it is obvious that it's super important to get um, feedback from individual researchers, from citizens, from any um, stakeholders, um, they have the, the right to, to have their voice heard. Uh, but I wanted just to point out that the perspective of institutions, universities as institutions, is not the same as the perspective of individual researchers. And this should not be, um, let's say, um, forgotten. So the voice of universities should be heard as such. And so this is why we call for this university check prior to developing EU legislation. I'll stop here for now. Um, happy to take questions, if any. Thanks. Thank you very much, Francie, and, 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 and thank you, obviously, for, I don't know, especially at the end, talking about the, the effort to avoid that aspect blind blind spot i think you you talked about a term that too often decisions are taken and I think we may talk about this later one of the issues with a lot of the rules around ai at the moment is that they don't seem to be at all considering they don't seem to be considering at all what that means for researchers who use ai who produce ai and so i think finding ways to address that i, I put a link into the chat to the joint letter and, and there's been some progress i think and due to some of the pressure that's been 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 uh, some of the the fact that the issue has been raised in improving the 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 toolkit but that actually still needs to be implemented properly the point you made around the difficulty of actually delivering on the knowledge valorization agenda um when there are when effectively there is a discrimination against any research that involves people who've come from the private sector maybe going back to it is a major issue. We had a set of council conclusions recently calling for more work on knowledge valorization, but unfortunately with no real reference to, and how do we make sure that it's not just the funding, but also the rules that actually support this. And certainly that point about the importance of institutions is really important. It still seems bizarre that 
small businesses can rely on competition law, individuals can rely on unfair contract laws, but institutions simply don't have that protection necessarily when they're going into discussions and when they're trying to actually get the possibility to support research. So fantastic. Thank you very much. So, as before, we'll, we'll run through the three speakers and then leave a little bit of time at the end to um, to, to, uh, to take any questions. If you have those questions, please do ask those in the Q&A function. Um, in the meanwhile, I'm very happy to invite Lydia Bael Damian to the floor. Um, she's Secretary General of, the, of Science Europe, and formerly she was Director for Research and Innovation at the European University Association. She has a doctorate in chemistry and has worked as an associate professor at the Universidad de Barcelona and the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya. She spent time as a visiting scholar at North Carolina State in the USA and the University of Western Ontario in Canada, and has also worked in the private sector as research and development deputy director at a chemical company in Spain and director of the research area at the Universidad Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. So with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Lydia. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you very much for the invitation. I am very happy to be here today uh, with these uh, excellent panelists sharing the thoughts about uh, what's the next phase for EU legislation in support of research. I, I feel many things have been said already, therefore I can only say that I very welcome the efforts of all my colleagues uh, before, the efforts of the Commission, always supportive, of research, uh, Michael, thank you very much for everything you do uh, with us and for us. And um, maybe I will highlight today the five uh, pledges that we prepared, Science Europe uh, prepared for the um, European elections, and uh, maybe a note on um, legislation, but more specifically to artificial intelligence and, and some challenges in this uh, respect. I. Um, First of all, for those who may not be familiar with Science Europe, we are an organization that represents national research funding and research performing organizations across Europe, currently with 40 big members all across Europe from Lithuania to uh, UK and Norway through uh, to Italy. So um, we, we provide this comprehensive view of what is public uh, research uh, from the concept of a call, let's say, of a call for proposals, right through to uh, publication and use of results. So it, it is from this perspective that we came up with five pledges that we put forward very short um, for hopefully MEP candidates to read them and also for those interested in, in research to see what in our view are main issues of concern. Clearly we are all in support of uh, soft or hard, but in a way better legislation in support of research activities. Um, however, a, a point to make is that we, trend, we tend to think only about what is in our court in research, but in fact, investing in research is investing in society, is investing in culture, in addition to competitiveness. We tend to look at research as a, perhaps as an instrument to build competitiveness, and that's right. But at the same time, um, outcomes of research are, are a source of culture, are a source of societal evolution. And I think that this is something that, despite politicians being more or less in research as such, I think that the cultural element that is linked to research should perhaps be more highlighted because it is, benefit, it is a benefit for all. So that was a, one of the first pledges is, is that invest in society, culture and competitiveness. That means invest in research as well. And we believe that um, we need to invest in research all across Europe and make many, many efforts to decrease the gap of the so-called widening and not only countries, but areas. Uh, where there is a clear underperformance of research and innovation, not because every region in Europe has to become a hub, but definitely not to have these uh, differences, enormous differences between those who invest the most and those who invest the least, which is 3%. That gap should be uh, not only decreased, but it should be raised on those that invest less and measures to help them to make progress in this direction 
uh, it should be of utmost concern to the Commission, but also to the new Parliament, etc. Second pledge was uh, the freedom of scientific inquiry. I probably, for those familiar in research, that doesn't come as a surprise. But the truth is that it is never enough um, effort in making that a statement and embedded into the institutional policies for that to be a reality. Without freedom of scientific inquiry, we cannot move on. We put science at the service of who knows who, probably governments or private interests. And that's fine. There will always uh, be an interest in these domains, but we need to respect the fundamental nature of research that is based on the freedom of scientific inquiry. We heard all over and over again, academics being uh, mistreated or uh, severely treated, mistreated, and even endangered and sometimes paying with their own lives. So we, 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 it is uh, of utmost importance that the academic sector comes strongly on that point and defends uh, scientific inquiry. And we believe that there are provisions, uh, at least the old uh, European Parliament started um, develop a concept note for um, a law or a soft law uh, providing uh, support for that. So we would be very happy to make progress in this direction. Uh, third pledge was collaboration, openness, and equity. Um, my colleagues have referred very widely uh, to this, um, so I will not uh, go too long on that. Um, other than saying that it is our responsibility as well to generate the best condition to attract and retain talent. And here, just uh, to um, build on the words of my colleague, Vincian Gaillard, yes, we need money, but also we need right policies. And attracting and retaining talent is of a policy that is of utmost importance to uh, be uh, productive and uh, advancing uh, research. A fourth pledge was equality, diversity, and inclusion. Also, some other colleagues have been referring to that. But for us, um, equality, diversity, and inclusion is uh, it, it is multidimensional. It is not just female, male. It is also diversity in terms of social background, access to education and research. It is in, in um, uh, sorry, um, uh, disability. It is about religion, it is about ethnicity. So the, the approaches to policies uh, towards equality should be broader than just tackling male and female, while this is of course remains as, a, as an important uh, point. Um, this, uh, we believe that developing more uh, legal frameworks, again, soft or hard law, encouraging the update and upgrade of policies regarding equality, diversity, and inclusion should be made. Last but not least, the, la, the, fa, the fifth um, pledge was on science communication. Science communication um, has been, up until now, with some honorable exceptions, concentrated on dissemination of successful results. That we believe has to change radically and concentrate more about communicating research processes from the, right from the beginning, right from the concept of the calls for uh, projects. That was one of the um, um, very good new good ideas that emerged out of a big conference we organized here in March in Brussels uh, as a frame in the framework of the Belgian uh, presidency. Um, where we had uh, many, many participants who said that science communication normally comes up too late, um, only uh, promoting, as I said before, that breakthrough discovery that maybe one day can make it to, to a very nice treatment for, for our health, etc., to uh, something much deeper that takes into account the characteristics of the research processes. This, together with uh, um, strengthening the literacy on research in uh, students, and not only in higher education, but even going down to the very uh, primary schools, 
uh, we believe uh, would be uh, necessary. Here, and then I'm turning to my last point, which is on artificial intelligence. Some of you, some of my colleagues have already referred to that. Artificial intelligence is on the edge to kind of, I don't know, I don't want to, to use the word govern our lives, but yes, <laughs> being very influential in the way we conceive and we, we move around. So it would be um, clear um, legislative frameworks in our lives, meaning now in research sector specifically, are much needed. There, the laws uh, that we have seen so far are too much um, looking at the markets, markets of artificial intelligence. Uh, honorable exception, the guidelines that were produced, of course, in March this year and to which we very happily contributed. But that, that was a very good beginning. They still fall short and they still need to be uh, more, I don't know if guidelines, but at least more discussions. Because AI requires, you know it, high computational power, large scales, computing resources. You, you have uh, referred to access. Um, this is, access is good. We need to have access. But education on why and how to use those data that we access is also very much needed. Skills and training, precisely, to use, reuse the data, et cetera, is very much uh, needed. And then also in terms of research, the, we tend to talk generally, at least in our circles, in the policy circles. But then, of course, every discipline has its own world and its own characteristics. And perhaps some of the guidelines that we formulate in a very general way need to be um, translated into the what it means for every discipline. And that is an enormous work that we ourselves cannot do. I mean, we from the institutions, uh, in, in here in Brussels, but that we need to do together with the scholarly communities. So more engagement with the scholarly communities to reflect what it means for them, uh, it is also necessary. And I think I would stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, and especially setting out those, those five key principles, which I think provide a really good guide on, on I think, I don't know, they provide a, a really good guide on how to think about research policy. I think also underline to some extent how actions in different policy areas are also actually affecting what happens to research as a whole. That you can feel that that issues around social policies, around fundamental human rights, around education, around territorial development, all have quite a a significant impact on how well we're actually delivering on the potential of research, how well we're actually letting this deliver lots of competitiveness, but also those responses, social challenges, promoting, uh, actually promote, um, promoting um, uh, resilience in general. I think especially those points around freedoms and around equity provide a really helpful lens for trying to understand whether the laws we have are actually being helpful or harmful right now. So um, I'm going to now hand over to, um, <clears throat> to Ole Peter Ottersen, who is the um, the Acting Secretary General of the Guild. Um, he's also a professor at the University of Warwick in the UK. He was <laughs> rector at the University of Oslo um, between 2009 and 2017. And between 2017 and 2023, he was president of the Karolinska Institute in, uh, in Sweden. Ole has rich experience in strengthening excellent science, excellent science across Europe, not only as a scientist himself, but also as chair of the Kavli Prize in Neurosciences for 2013 to 2017, and as a panel leader for the ERC Advanced Grants, Advanced Grants from 2008 to 2012, and the ERC Synergy Grants 2017 to 2019. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Ole Petter. Uh, thank you, uh, and also thank you for coupling me to Warwick, uh, but I'm not coupled to Warwick, so uh, I have a guest professorship uh, at Charité, in addition to being a professor at the University of Oslo. But uh, thank you for your very kind introduction, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, take part in this uh, discussion, which is a welcome discussion, because uh, 
if there is anything we have to do, it is to identify the barriers and to remove the barriers that, uh, well, hold us back as a continent when it comes to research and innovation. I think we all now, now based on the recent evidence that there is a sort of lagging behind problem. Europe is lagging behind other competitors when it comes to, um, uh, to uh, advanced technologies, not least. And it's quite clear we have to do something about it. So uh, this uh, discussion is uh, welcome. And uh, I think that uh, much is uh, to be done when it comes to um, uh, copyright and uh, not least the fear of copyright infringements. I, I'm not going to talk about copyright now because I think the issue has been covered quite extensively uh, throughout this uh, seminar. But there is one lens. You used, uh, Stephen, the term lens. Uh, I, <laughs> I will leave more or less all my points uh, and go back to one lens that I think is missing here when it comes to European competitiveness, but also when it comes to the barriers for excellent science innovation. And that is the global lens. Because uh, so far, the discussion has been focused more or less uh, exclusively on uh, Europe and the European Union. And understandably so, we have to... Uh, we have really to step up our efforts when it comes to our internal uh, collaborations. But after all, we all know that uh, Europe uh, is a tiny part of the world, to be more concrete. Uh, at present, we, uh, we account for about 9.32% of the world's population. And uh, after all, we are interconnected. And uh, the challenges interconnect us and also the solution must then be based on interconnectedness. I think we should go back to the pandemic. I'm a, I'm a physician, medical doctor, and I think it's a useful exercise, in fact, when we discuss barriers and when we discuss competitiveness in Europe, to look to see what happened during the pandemic. It, it, it was very, very clear that we were totally dependent on information, knowledge from other parts of the world, beyond Europe. And uh, what we see now in the Guild is uh, an attempt, of course, to um, be absolutely sure that we are on safe grounds. I mean, the security issues come up now when we dis discuss uh, global academic cooperation. So my first point will be, we have to apply a global perspective lens when we're discussing competitiveness. We have to ensure that all the measures that are being made when it comes to security issues do not lead to a sort of decoupling of uh, the acad academic connections with uh, the rest of the world. That will hurt our competitiveness. And uh, we have to use this lens, the global lens, extensively in the years to come to be sure that we can profit from the knowledge that is being generated in other parts of the world. So the Guild, consisting of uh, 22 research-intensive universities in Europe, the Guild is very, very clear that we have to safeguard the uh, global academic corporations and everything that has to be done when it comes to security issues must take into account also the need to uphold the global academic uh, corporations. That's absolutely essential. The Guild tries now to uh, implement, in fact, what is a very important part of EU policies, and that is to uh, boost the collaboration with uh, Africa, not least. So the Guild is establishing 20 clusters of uh, research excellence with universities in uh, Africa, the African uh, Research University Alliance. And uh, we are seeing then that steps must be taken also to look at the obstacles, the barriers that prevent us from uh, really developing to the full extent international collaborations uh, on which Europe is very dependent. So that's the first point. The lens must also take the global perspective into account. Then we have um, point two, uh, a very, very important uh, issue, I think, in this particular uh, discussion. And that is, of course, how to marry excellent science, excellent research with excellent innovation. I think the document that uh, was just uh, published, how to um, 
get out of the uh, middle technology gap is a very good starting point for a discussion on this uh, particular issue. I guess you have all read this uh, very interesting report from the European Policy uh, Analysis Group. It tells us in no uncertain terms that we need to have much more breakthrough science and breakthrough innovation in the European Union. And then we cannot focus on the, the high technology readiness levels. We have to go for the uh, low technology readiness level. Where exactly is the place that excellent science and excellent innovation is married and coupled? This is absolutely essential, I think, for the future competitiveness of Europe. So we have to oversee the instruments in the EU that is uh, targeting innovation to ensure that we have the best possible synergy also with excellent science. The third point is also, I think, uh, of interest. I'm in constant uh, discussion with um, my uh, American colleagues and I look to Europe and I see that we are champions very often when it comes to regulation. And of course, it's a very good thing to regulate, for example, artificial intelligence, which does impose a threat if not handled in a responsible manner. But our American colleagues tell me that, yes, when you are champions of regulation, you should also be champions when it comes to unleashing the opportunities offered by new technologies, for example, artificial intelligence. There must be a balance here. And what we as universities fear in the Guild is, of course, that a uh, too strong focus on regulation takes away the possibility to, in fact, unleash the power of new technologies. There must be a balance here. But by all means, we have to be careful with new technologies. And what is also important is that every new technology must have an interface with society that uh, helps uh, introduce new technologies on the uh, society. And then we need social sciences, art and humanities. So we must not forget that new hard technologies must, again, I use this word, married, married with competence in uh, social sciences, arts and humanities. So these are three different issues, I think, that are important. Just one very specific comment on uh, European health data space, which is very relevant in this particular context. Uh, the future of Europe is very much about health, and we have to have instruments in place that allow us to uh, remove some of that obstacles when it comes to the use of data for research in the health arena. And uh, we have gone through the, the uh, European health data space regulations, and uh, we see many issues that need to be handled. There are many issues here that I think uh, should be brought up in this context uh, of uh, uh, KR21, for example, that there is there are inconsistencies between uh, e, uh, European health data space regulations and other legal acts. There are vague definitions and clear ethical requirements, uh, not uh, sufficiently distinct allocation of responsibility. The European health data space regulations must be revised so that we are absolutely sure that we can use data for the best possible in the best possible way in Europe. Finally, I would just uh, add that uh, what we're discussing now is uh, very important. N next year, we will uh, celebrate 80 years, the 80 year anniversary of uh, Science the Endless Frontier that brought the USA to the helm of uh, science and education. And one very important aspect of uh, uh, science endless frontier is that it led to this perception that everybody must be able to drink from an open pool of knowledge. This is essential. But the point is that this concept should not just be for Europe. It must be seen in a global perspective because we are interconnected and absolutely dependent on the influx of knowledge from other parts of the world. So these were just uh, three points and I uh, hope uh, that uh, they uh, fit into the general discussion because this general discussion is absolutely essential for the future of Europe. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. 
Thank you very much. That, that's fantastic. And, and and I think certainly coming from someone who, whose day job is at an international uh, library association, the importance of making sure that, that it's possible to work across borders globally is, is, is hugely important. That discussion does take place at the World Intellectual Property Organization. It just takes place very, very slowly. Um, but of course, the, the potential of Europe to be a leader in this space, to actually show the way, to show what's possible by allowing people to work together is is, is absolutely crucial here. Um, I think, again, that, that point about the the importance of enabling everywhere, um, all parts of, of Europe, all the places where science is taking place, where research is taking place, to tap into that global network is important. So at the risk of using that word lens again, that um, the equity lens is a really important one, that inclusivity lens is, is hugely important. I like the reference to the the science, the endless frontier, I suppose it brings us back also to this idea of, I don't know, freedom of circulation of knowledge, freedom of circulation of ideas. We talked about epistemic liberalism previously as well and how to get that in there. And that fits in quite nicely with talk around knowledge commons and this idea of this common pool. What Michael was talking about earlier in terms of the importance of access and use and not just thinking about what's proprietary and what's owned as a route towards going forwards. So um, I'm conscious that we are about four minutes from the end, and I do intend to end on time because I'm conscious that everyone is busy. Um, I would uh, encourage our speakers. There was a, a very good, um, there was a very interesting question in the chat from um, uh, from Annalise, um, focusing on what does a research check looks like that takes account of different um, actors in order to make sure that legislation in other areas is, is actually helpful, is constructive. So I hope that all of our speakers will be able to take a quick look at that one. Um, in the last few minutes, I think as Ben trailed quickly, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the action plan. Clearly, um, Ben's done a great job um, of running through actually the substance. And I think, as you will have seen in there, there's a real mixture of um, <clears throat> measures focused on copyright, the law itself, on how it's implemented, but also looking more broadly, what's that comprehensive set of political and of policy tools that are needed to make sure that research is possible to overcome some, not just the legal challenges, but the implementation challenges that there can be to supporting research, science and their implementation within Europe. Um, in terms of how you can get hold of the EU Action Plan, um, the link has gone up in the chat a couple of times. Please do take a photo of the QR code right now. Um, you can also find it through knowledgerights21.org and I'll show you where to find it through there. Um, so if you go to our homepage and just say that's knowledgerights21.org, go up to resources and just towards the top right hand corner, click on position papers, and then you'll see it will be the top left one alongside some of the other areas where we've issued materials. You will also see that we've done a little bit of work around artificial intelligence, how to make sure that the research implications, the interests of research institutions, of researchers are not forgotten, as well as looking around, looking at questions around the, uh, how far research is taken into account in impact assessments, on secondary publishing rights, on ebooks and lending. Um, I should also note, um, before we come to the end, please do sign up to our newsletter. I'm sure that a number of you have come here today because you received an email through that, but Again, QR code, please do sign up to that newsletter to hear from us more regularly on roughly a monthly basis on what's going on. Um, and finally, um, please do look out. Um, there we have another webinar coming up before um, our summer, the Northern Hemisphere summer at least. And this picks up on a really interesting piece of work that's taking part in another piece of the commission, looking at questions about remote access and use of materials held by libraries and other institutions. It's a pretty key question for research, as we've heard a few times already. And that's coming up on the 5th of July. And you'll find that, you'll find a link to that from the homepage of our website. So um, with that, um, in order to finish on time, I wanted therefore to let's have a quick look at the questions and um, a quick look at the um so i just wanted to say thank you very much to all of our speakers today to michael to gerard to maria to ben to marcian to lydia to olipetta um, and paul does olipetta for forgetting your affiliations wrong there we will make sure that's correct and um, that we don't make that mistake on on the website at all um and with that please do stay in touch sign up to that newsletter and think about how you can draw on that action plan. It's there as a resource. It's there as a conversation starter. Um, it's there to hopefully provide a basis for thinking about how can we have a really 
ambitious, a really productive, a really pro-equity, pro-competitiveness research strategy within Europe going forward. So with that, thank you very much for your time and I wish you a very good rest of the day.